Hello YouTube, I'm Douglas, and this is my Voxel Game Engine. It's a video game project that I'm coding, where the entire world is made out of tiny little, fully editable cubes. This month, I've been working on an exciting new feature, which is realistic, rigid body physics. Now, objects that are not part of the terrain can move around, slide, bounce, and collide with one another in a realistic way. It's possible to drag objects around using the mouse and interact with them. And if you delete part of the terrain, anything that becomes disconnected will turn into a separate rigid body and be simulated by the physics code. Meaning that yes, it's possible to chop a tree down and watch it fall, unlike another popular block game. Those who have been subscribed to my channel for a while now, you should totally subscribe if you haven't, will recall that I did implement a physics engine last year, but it was my very first attempt at ever writing physics code, and it was laggy, buggy, and worst of all, physically inaccurate. The first physics engine that I wrote did not conserve energy or momentum as objects hit each other and moved through the scene, which meant that, for example, if you tossed one box at another box, the boxes would just hit each other, there would be no response, no momentum would be transferred to the second box from the first, and this made the game a lot less interesting and fun, because you couldn't say, stack one object on top of another, and then knock it off um, using a flying donut. The plan for this video is to describe the architecture of the new physics engine, and I'll be going into detail about all of the ways that I've improved the two core components, collision detection and response. But before we dive into the details, I'd like to say a quick word about today's sponsor, CodeCrafters. CodeCrafters is an online education platform built by experienced software developers for experienced software developers. It has a whole bunch of cool project guides that will walk you through how to build a ubiquitous piece of software. They're adding new projects all the time, too. Since I joined, for example, they've added a project that teaches you how to build your own shell, and another project that teaches you how to build your own scripting language interpreter. They're a really great resource, and I'd highly recommend them if you're, say, looking to learn a new programming language, but don't have a project for it yet. You can check out Code Crafters for free today by using the link in the description. Now, let's talk about collision detection. Collision detection is the first step in any physics engine, and it involves taking pairs of objects in the scene, figuring out where they overlap, and then producing a list of contact points and associated data, which can later be used to move the objects apart and make it look like they bounced. In order to make collision detection fast, there are a couple of things you want to do. For one, you want to check as few points as possible for collisions, because doing less work obviously yields faster results. And in addition, you want to produce the fewest number of contacts that describe your rigid bodies properly, because the fewer contacts there are, the less work the second step, the collision solver, will need to do. In the context of voxels, this means taking two voxel grids, one of which may be arbitrarily rotated and translated with respect to the other, and figuring out which voxels touch. In my previous engine, I would do this by literally going through any pair of voxels that were near one another and running a precise separating axes test. This was problematic because it generated a lot of contacts. For example, a box sitting on the ground like this would have contacts for every single voxel on its bottom surface. That meant taking more time to run extra collision detection tests, and it meant producing more contact points. To improve this, I turned to the game Teardown for inspiration. Teardown's collision detection system is described in this public tech talk that the engine's author, Dennis Gustafsson, did, and it's a really enlightening talk, I would highly recommend watching it. But the core idea that Teardown uses is that if you have two polygons that are touching one another, either one polygon's edge will be touching another polygon's edge, or one polygon's vertex will be touching somewhere on the other polygon's exterior. So what this means is that it's not necessary to include every voxel during collision detection. Let's start off by defining corner and edge voxels. 
We do this by considering the adjacent voxels along any particular axis, x, y, or z. I call a voxel a corner if it is not surrounded on both sides by other voxels for any axis. So this would be a corner, but this would not be a corner. Similarly, I define a voxel as an edge if it is surrounded on both sides by others along exactly one axis. So this would be an edge, but this would not be an edge. Now that we've defined corners and edges, we can leverage the fact that a corner or an edge will always be involved in a collision between two polyhedra. To do this, my physics engine generates a physics acceleration structure whenever an object spawns, and this acceleration structure tracks the corner and edge voxels within the object. Then when it's time to do collision detection, I test the corner voxels of one object against all the voxels of the other, and vice versa, and then I test the edges of one object against the edges of the other. And this is great because you end up testing fewer things, and it also generates far fewer contacts. Like Dennis Gustafsson points out in the Teardown Tech Talk, a box sitting on the ground like this only generates contacts associated with the corner voxels, and this is a huge improvement. Another improvement the talk mentions involves figuring out whether voxels themselves are overlapping. Previously, whenever my engine figured out that two voxels were close together, it would test them for an actual collision using a precise box-box separating axes test. And this is something I talk about more in a previous video, but the short of it is, this is an expensive but perfectly accurate algorithm that will tell you whether two boxes which are arbitrarily rotated with respect to one another are touching. And this algorithm was good, but it turns out for voxels that are this small, you don't need that level of accuracy. And so what you can do instead to test whether two voxels are intersecting is take a voxel from one volume, transform it into the coordinate system of the second volume that you're testing, and then check to see whether any of the eight voxels which are closest to that original voxel's transformed center point are full. If so, we consider a collision to have occurred. This approach skips all the work associated with separating axes tests, so it's much faster. And it does ignore the rotations of the individual voxels themselves, so voxels end up behaving kind of like tiny little spheres, which isn't even a bad thing, it makes many objects sort of roll or slide more than they normally would. With the collision detection system upgraded, I turned my attention to the collision solver. The point of the collision solver is to take all of the contacts generated in the first step of the physics code and then move objects apart so that they're no longer interpenetrating and ensure that they're all moving with the correct velocities. A realistic collision solver allows for force to be transferred between objects. So if, say, this box on the left slides over and hits these two boxes on the right, the other two boxes should start moving with some amount of momentum that was transferred during the collision. This was the part that I really got wrong in my previous physics engine, because it only simulated one object at a time. So during the simulation I would take one object, I would treat all other objects in the scene as fixed and unmoving, I would update the position and velocity of that one object, and then I would continue through one object at a time. And this meant in my previous engine, forces didn't transfer between objects. If you stacked like one box on top of another, it wouldn't be possible to lift the top box up by applying a force to the bottom box. And this led to a lot of um, buggy and unrealistic behavior. For example, if you just put a single tiny little voxel object on top of a big tree, the big tree would be sort of pinned to the ground. Um, you wouldn't be able to move the big tree or lift it up because of that one tiny voxel on top of it. So to learn how to do collision solving better, I went ahead and I read a book called Game Physics Engine Development by Ian Millington. And I'm not sponsored, but this is another really excellent resource. It makes all of the math um, very clear and intuitive, and it even comes with an example physics engine implementation that you can reference as you go through the book. So I read this book, I figured out its approach to collision solving, and then I went ahead and I implemented that. The iterative solver is broken into two parts, position and velocity adjustment, and they both proceed in basically the same way. 
Each algorithm takes a single contact from the list of contacts that were generated during collision detection, and it figures out how to change the object's positions and or velocities in order to make them no longer interpenetrate and in order to ensure momentum is transferred. And this math you can find in the book, but it's the same sort of math you would be doing in a basic, like, physics 1 course. It's just conservation of momentum and energy as you update the object's velocities. It's not too hard. The real problem lies in the fact that there isn't just one contact, but many. When the physics solver moves two objects apart to resolve one contact, it may change the severity of other contacts between the two objects. Since solving multiple contacts simultaneously is a very difficult challenge, the physics solver instead proceeds in an iterative fashion. It solves one contact, and then it goes through the list of contacts and updates all the other ones based upon however it changed the position and velocities of the objects involved. Then it chooses another contact to solve, usually the next worst contact, changes the objects so that that contact is no longer a problem, and then updates all of the other contacts in the list again so that the changes in position and velocity are reflected in the contact data. The iterative solver repeats this process, looping over the contact list again and again, until all contacts have been resolved, and momentum has been transferred for every single one of them. And that's an overview of how my two-phase, point-based iterative physics engine works. The biggest thing that was helpful for me in learning how to do this was really leveraging my resources, using the Teardown Tech Talk and Millington's book, and I also built a small 2D version of this physics engine before going into 3D and applying it to my voxel game. And that was a really big help because 2D is a lot simpler to work with, and I was able to get a feel for what the math should be like and what bugs I'd encounter. So that'd be my biggest recommendation if you're interested in physics engines and just starting out, is to build something in 2D, because it'll be a lot easier, and it's honestly what I should have done uh, the first time I made a physics engine, rather than trying to go to 3D right away. If you want to try the engine out for yourself, there's a demo linked in the description. You can play it online in Chrome, Edge, or Opera, or you can download a native version of the demo for best performance. Lastly, if you have any thoughts or questions, be sure to leave a like and a comment down below. I'd be more than happy to discuss your ideas with you. Next up, I'm planning to work on a building system for my game to allow users to finally create some cool looking scenes. So make sure to subscribe in order to stay tuned for the next episode. Thanks for watching.